The virtue, frugalitas, frugalness, economy of, and simplicity of style, not miserly, not cheap, and not low quality, but using cost leadership and frugality in the marketplace. Now this is another virtue that Howard is extremely passionate about. You could tell he was passionate about the last virtue, industriousness. So Howard, when you talk about frugality, go easy on him and let him know what to do. <laughs> was I being too hard on him, Judith? Maybe a little. Judith said at the break, I was being too, too tough on you guys, so I gotta lighten it up a little bit. Frugality. Frugality is not being cheap. It's not cheap, chintzy. Dennis always say, oh, I don't wanna be cheap. Uh, you know, I don't care about overhead. I don't wanna be cheap. I'm not chintzy, I'm not like that. Well, it's not about cheap and chintzy and miserly. That's, uh, that's just not it. That, that's like saying someone's selfish when they're following their own self-interest. That's a judgment call. But what it is, it's a virtue. When Southwest Airlines lowers their cost and they're frugal, they make great low-cost decisions and become more efficient, their customers have the freedom to afford to fly. When Walmart comes to a small town where all the nice people have little bitty shops buying shoes for $10 and marking them up to 20 and Walmart buys them for 10 and marks them up $1.20, um, Walmart is not being mean and nasty and cruel and unfair competition. They're being frugal. They use their mind to lower their cost, just like Home Depot to the home improvement industry, or Ikea, who is now the richest man in the world. Um, cost leadership and frugality in the marketplace is a very s intense protective moat around your business. Think of a castle. The king and queen would build a moat around their castle and fill it with oil, and if enemies come, they'd light it on fire, or they'd fill it with water and crocodiles and snakes. Uh, the number one protective moat around a business is be the low-cost leader. If you can do a crown for $6.95 and everyone across the street is charging $8.95, you're going to walk away with the lion's share of a market. Today's dental has always been focused on being um, cost leadership. Um, we listen to the pain and suffering that people let out when you tell them it's going to be a couple thousand dollars uh, for a root canal billup and crown. I always say God gave you two eyes. Keep one eye on the customer, one eye on cost, and use your God-given talents, your brain, to work hard. And working hard is using your brain to work hard driving down cost so that your customers, your patients, have the freedom to afford what it is you sell. And once you take your eye off cost, your prices get so high that you might as well take your eye off half the customers, which is why, once again, in the United States, go to oralhealthamerica.org and read the nation's uh, report card on oral health. Um, Judith and I give these people 5,000 bucks a year. It's a great charity, and they tell you that at 65, one in three have no teeth, one in three have less, lost more than half their teeth. Um, it's a brutal business, and it's hard to be a rich dentist in America and really feel connected to these bottom one-third that lose all their teeth. It's not pretty, it's not moral, it's not ethical, and it's not virtuous. Um, Lots of people have a hard time listening to the market. Like, you'll hear Dennis, the patient, will say, do you have nice socks? I say, no. Uh, you open weekends? No. You open Saturdays? No. Do uh, you take my insurance? No. Uh, do you take this? No. In fact, one, some, some dental offices, I swear, they answer the phone, what is it about no you don't understand? And every time someone wants something, they just say no, and then they tell them what they think, or, or they just have a one-liner. Start tracking no's. When customers ask you for something and you say no, track it. Because then at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, or even the end of the year, you can sit there and be looking at this and realize that you don't even hear 80% of the yeses and nos because the receptionist handles most of them when they call the office. Or maybe they ask the hygienist. Or maybe when the dentist leaves the room, they ask the assistant. But you know, at the end of the month, when you track and you find out that 68 people asked if you were open Saturday and you told every one of them no, that another 48 people asked if you take uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shields PPO. When you start seeing the numbers tally up, then you might go back to that PPO and say, you know, a insurance company is really third degree price discrimination. First degree price discrimination is I charge each person what they can bear. I would charge Bill Gates $1,000 for a Coke and Howard for and a nickel. Um, and, and that's illegal. Um, secondary price discrimination is volume discounts. 
Um, you buy a Barbie doll for four dollars, but Walmart buys them for a dollar because Walmart ordered a million of them. Well, when an insurance company comes in and says, uh, "Here's our fees," you got to remember it's for a couple hundred patients. And if you're tracking getting to yes, and you find out that um, 118 people last year asked you if you took a PPO and you said no, well, don't look at it as the fees for one person. Look at it for a group. Would you treat 100 people and give them all a 20% price break um, if you got all 100 of them? So uh, PPOs are just volume discounts, second degree price discrimination. Third degree price, second degree price discrimination is legal. Third degree price discrimination where you charge different amounts um, for different zip codes is illegal and you often see that in some dental insurance companies and a lot of auto insurance um, for cars. But start tracking um, getting to yes. Start tracking how many times you say no. A lot of dentists will call me up and they'll say, uh, do you think I should uh, open evenings? And I'll say, do I look like Dionne Warwick? I mean, am, am I on the psychic hotline? I mean, why are you asking me? I don't even know. Um, the United States of America is probably the bizarrest term I've ever heard because the United States is like Europe. I mean, how do you compare San Francisco to Kansas? How do you compare Miami to New Jersey? How do you compare Cleveland um, to Oklahoma City? Um, how do you compare Minneapolis-St. Paul to Santa Fe? The United States, in my opinion, is at least 10 or 15 different countries all wrapped up under one flag. And the dental industry is like that. It's very different in small rural towns as it is in downtown Manhattan. So focus on your own market. I mean, think global, but act local. Think global concepts and macroeconomics, but think local microeconomics um, for your own patients and your own community. What are they asking for? Um, in some counties, um, nitrous oxide's huge. Others, it's not. Some went put to sleep. Some went pre-medicated. Um, um, and that's why the DOCS program, uh, the doctor's uh, oral sedation is uh, growing so fast. Uh, that Nancy Hamill talks about a lot on Dentaltown. But think about, um, think about what your local market is thinking, microeconomics versus big macroeconomic conversations that we're having today. Look at the price of DVDs. We say keep one eye on your customer, one eye on cost. You know, look at the wild price of DVDs. You know, they came out in 97 at $800 with very few features. And then the next year it went to 600 and a couple of years later it was 400 and then it was 200 and now they're $39. In fact, I had a dream the other day that when I was uh, 65, I was having breakfast with a bowl, of, a box of Lucky Charms, and I was pouring into my bowl, and a free DVD player came out. I mean, remember the first calculator? Um, what was it? Five million dollars, and was like 3,000 pounds, and and now you get solar-powered calculators in your cereal box for free. Everything else in America gets cheaper every year, except services. They just keep raising the price. Um, it's why only three industries destroy capital, government, health care, and education. If you gave the education, um, Department of Education, a hundred billion dollars, two billion extra for every state, um, they would destroy the capital because at the end of the day they'd still say we're only having one teacher for every 30 kids and they'd take all that money and just give the teachers higher wages and more benefits and less hours worked all under the nobility that you know that some baseball player makes five million a year and some poor teacher makes fifty thousand a year and isn't that just a travesty which is just retarded because almost anyone could be a teacher and almost no one could hit sixty five home runs a year and it's called supply and demand but but look at the teachers i'm here in arizona where the university of phoenix online is adding forty five to fifty thousand new students a month because they're teaching them with technology i mean in economics we only have people, capital, technology. Phoenix Online is using technology and to be able to have a lesson teach more people. And your teacher, uh, your kid's uh, 10 years old and he's in the middle of math class and he's having some daydream about catching frogs down by the river or using crawdads for catfish bait, not listening to a thing the teacher says. Then they give him a pop quiz and he gets an F and everybody starts telling you your son's stupid. And if he would have had a high technology computer that explained the lesson um, he could have sat there and after he got done daydreaming, goes back to his lessons and starts doing it and he'd have been better educated um, and the teacher instead of 30 students could see 40 students, could see 50 students. They would have gains in productivity. But see in healthcare and education and government, I mean here, here's the government and there's still 40 people needed to make a driver's license. I mean it's just crazy. Um, you still have um, 30,000 employees 
to send out grandma's social security check. I mean, it could be, all be electronic. It could be deposited electronically in your bank. You can get rid of 20,000 people to the social security department, raise everybody's benefits significantly. But see, social security is about creating jobs. It's a job justification program. And that's what we see in healthcare. Look at hygiene. Um, you could add to your hygiene department. You could throw in digital x-rays to save time on x-rays, uh, perio charting. You could dump in twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 of technology and your hygienist will still want an hour to do a recall. I mean, you can go in there and say, hey, your next patient's recall. Um, she has an upper denture, lower partial, two teeth. How long do you need? And your hygienist say, I need an hour. I mean, it's like something they read in the Old Testament. You know, you need an hour for every cleaning. Um, you read, uh, I don't know if it's the New Testament or the Old Testament, where every teacher can only have 30 students. Uh, but there's no gains in productivity in healthcare, education, and government. Whereas with computers and DVDs, every year they make more products with more features for less money. Uh, so think of the difference between what we're seeing on the services side versus the product side. And look how much the product side uses high technology, they take a lot of capital, invest in a lot of technology, and make better things for less money. And in healthcare, education, and government, they just want more money for more unions. I mean, I'm a doctor with an MBA, and I'm not legal to teach in the state of Arizona because I don't have a teaching certificate. And uh, I'd like to see one person with a teaching certificate pass the dental admissions test. I'd like to see them tell me about the Krebs cycle, physics, calculus. I I'd like to see them pass that test. But I'm a dentist with a master's in business. I can't teach in the state of Arizona because the teachers are concerned about teachers unions preserving jobs, not about education. So start, this, um, uh, I'm trying to shake up. I'm trying to get you to think outside the box. How come... Um, it took you an hour to do a crown the day you got out of dental school, and 10 years later, it still takes an hour. See, that's no gains in productivity. If everybody, if all the farmers did this, you know, 1900, two and three Americans were farmers. Um, you always see these dope smoking Willie Nelsons, you know, take a bong hit and say that they're sad that farmers go bankrupt. Well, if you don't want any farmers to go bankrupt, move to China and India where everyone's still a farmer. But see, in America, a few farmers use technology, replace their cows with tractors and bigger tractors and fertilizers and diesel engines. And now it only takes 1.7 farmers to feed America and have enough left over to export. We're not trying to save farmers in America. We want the inefficient farmers to go bankrupt and then they can be recycled in the economy to be, um, you know, cutting your hair, making you a sub sandwich, you know, doing something. But if more people are needed, if the same number of people are needed each year, one hygienist for cleaning for an hour, one teacher can only have 30 students, um, takes 20 people to make a driver's license. If that's your constraint and you never change it, then you never service more people. I mean, let's do the math on hygienists. If a hygienist works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, it's 2,000 hours, can only see you twice a year for an hour in a six month recall. We're discounting all periodontal disease, three and four month recalls. And you only have 80,000 hygienists in America. I know because I have owned Hygiene Town and we mailed all the hygienists and there's just 80,000 of them. Well, 80,000 hygienists servicing 1,000 people twice a year is only 80 million people. Last I checked, this country's got 280 million people. So the other 200 million people couldn't even get their teeth cleaned every six months because a hygienist starts with the concept each patient takes an hour. And you say, well, what if a hygienist runs two chairs and gets a helper? No. You know, you said teacher students. Well, does a teacher, do we really need a teacher for every 30 students? Can we just put in 30 computers and then maybe give her 10 more students? And they just say, no, they'll go on strike. It's not about education. And if you're so concerned about the oral health care of America, then there's not enough hygienists to service these people. So think up your model, shake up your model. Um, because if the model's not working, like today, capitalism works great for a billion people in the 40 richest countries, doesn't really work for 5 billion people in the 170 poorest countries, especially the bottom 40. So um, if it's going to work for a billion but not 5 billion, you're going to see a resurge of, of uh, anarchy, tyranny, despots, communism, uh, militant, um, everything. So same thing inside your backyard. You're in a small town community. Um, you decide you only want to do dentistry on the rich, okay? But you're the only dentist in a town of 2,000. The whole town isn't rich. You know, sure, there's a few guys driving a Lincoln Town car, but what about the people that drive a 67 Chevy? What about the people in a broken-down Ford? 
Um, you have to be able to realize that you have a community responsibility because you're a doctor. You don't sell tacos at Taco Bell. You're a doctor. And if you're in military, government, education, health care, you have a community responsibility for public health along with making money in free enterprise and capitalism. And don't live off all the benefits of free enterprise and capitalism, but then refuse to implement those in your business. Um, the Industrial Revolution, Henry Ford is not only one of my idols, um, he's also um, ADEC's idol. Um, Ken Austin um, loved Henry Ford. And one of the reasons he loved Henry Ford is, you know, Henry Ford comes out with a Model T in 1908 for $890. Each year, the car gets better and the price comes down. By 1912, it was down to $690. By 1914, it dropped to $490. By 1925, it was down to $290. One of Henry Ford's genius inventions was not only the assembly line with standardized parts, but if you bought a Ford in 1908, those parts were all interchangeable with any Ford in 1925. One of the reasons people love Fords is because you could buy a Ford in 1925 and say your motor block uh, went out or died. If you went and found a motor block in some dead Model T, the 1908 in your grandpa's farm field, or a wheel or an axle or anything, you could take out that wheel or axle or whatever and know that you could take that to your 1925 car and still exchange it. In fact, basically Henry Ford only had about, in his whole run of Model T's, he only had two different assembly setups. So for a first decade or two, everything was interchangeable. Then he finally had to make some changes. Um, then he stuck to interchangeable parts for the next 10, 20 years. Um, ADEC, um, Ken Austin, Ken and Joan Austin did that with um, ADEC chairs. Um, you could buy an ADEC chair. You could buy the first one and take parts off of it, and it would still work in an ADEC chair 10, 20 years later. This is why ADEC sells 100 chairs a day, and they're in a fantastic company. And probably without a doubt, the, the gold standard um, what gutta purchased root canals, ADEC is the chairs. And it comes from standardized parts, it gives an, and low cost begins on design. Like, let's think about your house. If you, just, if you build a house, and you decide that you're going to paint it blue, well, the decision to paint it blue on a 100-year house, by the time you build a house and the time it falls down and the cockroaches ate it and it's in a bad area of town, is about a 100-year cycle. Well, if you decide to paint your house, now you're going to have to repaint it every five years. You're going to have to repaint it 20 times. Think of all the pollution, the expense, the toxic materials, where if you would have had a brick house, I mean, go back to Europe. Every time you see something really old that's 1,000 years old, was it made of wood, paneling, sheetrock, or how about stucco? That's a good one. When you come to Arizona, they just put chicken wire and blow stuff on the wall, and that's your house. Um, none of that will be here in 100 years. But when they build a rock, brick, stone castle, it's still there 100 years later. Go inside your house. The number one, any city in America, including Los Angeles, when they're having a pollution day, the pollution inside your home is usually 50 times higher than the pollution outside your home. And one of the major sources of pollution is carpets um, oozing formaldehyde and toxins in the air. Well, if you design your home, you decide to put carpet. Well, you just made a decision to replace the carpet every five years, 20 times over 100 years, all that pollution, all that carpet going in landfills, whereas you would have laid tile. But a lot of people would have said, well, tile's more expensive than carpet. Well, you're not thinking. I mean, you tile it one time, it's good for 100 years, unless you're anal. You put in carpet, you pretty much got to replace it every five years, especially in our house with four dogs, or four humans, four baby humans, Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach, um, six turtles, two rabbits, three cats. I mean, trust me, we should replace our carpet every night. Um, but the bottom line is you design low cost from the inception. You design high cost from the inception. If you were to lower pollution, you don't wait till a car shows up at the, at, the, uh, at the gosh darn dump and then decide what to do with it. You have to design um, recycling in the product from the beginning. Um, you have to design lower cost in your business model from day one. You can't perform a root canal and then just lower your fee because you may be doing the root canal at a loss and if you do too many root canals at a loss, you'll go out of business. But design low cost from the front. Um, Henry Ford, an important lesson, in, an important factor in sales is the process of continuous product improvement which stimulates consumer demand by providing increasing value for the customer's dollar. Um, Ken and Joan Austin do this repeatedly. 
Um, Consumer Reports found, this is from Regina Herschlinger, a PhD medical economist from Harvard University, um, says that Consumer Reports found that the most satisfied customers were those who bought from the chain stores that charge the least. There's a heck of a lot more cons customer satisfaction with a crown that costs 600 than a crown that costs 1200 The more you charge, the more dissatisfaction there is. And Jeff Bezos of um, Amazon.com um, says there are two kinds of companies, those that work to raise prices and those that work to lower them. And a lot of the dentists think that just if they raise their prices, they'll make more money. Like I'll say, well, what do you make the most money on the crown? Well, what do you like to do the most? Oh, a crown. I just love crowns. So what are you going to do at the end of the year? Oh, raise my crown $100. Well, now you're going to do less of them. I thought you really liked crowns. I thought you really loved them. I thought you were good at it. Well, if you really like them and you're good at it, the number one t form of marketing is price. Just lower your price. At the end of the year, when everybody's going to raise their price 100 bucks, lower yours and you'll do more of them. Um, think of increasing scales of return. Um, an average price for a fax machine in 1980 was 12,700. By 85, it fell to 3,000. By 1990, it was 1,500. By 1994, there was one fax machine for every eight people in a business in the United States with an estimated 25 million fax machines for use in the world. But think of the first fax, 12,700. Who are you gonna fax? You, you buy the first fax machine, who are you gonna fax? No one, I mean, you can go in the closet and fax yourself, but you know, who are you gonna send a fax to? What if you got the first phone? Who are you gonna call? But every time someone else gets a fax or a phone, it becomes more valuable. You sell more, so the price goes down, and each one becomes more valuable because they become ubiquitous. And then you say to a common man, hey, can I fax you? Sure, what's your fax number? And they give it to you. As the price comes down, more people buy, it becomes ubiquitous, it becomes the standard of care. We're slowly seeing that with ortho and saving your teeth. Back when I was little, I grew up in Catholic Kansas. The um, um, United States has 280 million people. The number one religion is uh, Catholicism, Catholics. It's about 70 million people. And Wichita was about 25% Catholic. In a big Catholic family, um, you know, you had six, seven kids, and the ugliest kid with the most gnarled teeth got braces and everybody else would survive. Um, now, with the advent of birth control, at the end of World War II, average mom had four kids. By 2000, the average mom had two kids. Um, at the end of World War II, average mom had her first baby at 16. Um, 50 years later, the first baby's at 26. So women are having half the kids and starting 10 years later. And when you only have two kids, um, then, you know, they both get braces. And back when you had seven kids, you pulled a lot of teeth. And when you only have two kids, you save the teeth. So endo, root canals, implants, saving teeth, cleanings, exams, x-rays are skyrocketing, whereas dentures and parcels are removable. Um, are actually going down among the higher class and the upper middle class. But since our poor is growing rapidly, uh, especially with, uh, you know, we're getting almost uh, two and a half million immigrants a year in the United States, um, you know, there's still a bigger market in that segment of the economy. But um, the bottom line is, as the prices come down, people have more money, it starts to become standard of care. Now, a great way to buy stocks is I always say, buy, bet on the man. Um, you know, don't, don't look at financials and P&Ls. I mean, I mean look, look at Michael Dell. That is the modern day Henry Ford. I mean, when Michael Dell started his uh, business, uh, you know, a computer and a PC was three, 4,000 bucks. And this is the first this is the uh, third quarter, the first quarter of 2005. When I read the 10Q from Dell, I got goosebumps and I almost cried because for the first time in the history of Dell, their number one sales and profit and income wasn't from the United States of America, but the computer had gotten all the way down to under $500 and the country with the most sales and net income for Dell was China. And owning Dentaltown.com, we've always been able to see when people register where they're coming from. And as a computer, I, I remember when the stock market crashed in 2000, March of 2000, when NASDAQ went from 5065 down to 1600. And what did Dell do? How did Dell respond when the stock market NASDAQ went from 5045 um, to 1600? What did he do? He just slashed his prices. He got the personal computer down to under a thousand, 
and by 2005, it was under 495. The whole world is going to computers, and Michael Dell is the modern-day Henry Ford. There's no question about it. And by the way, his dad's an orthodontist, and his brother's an ophthalmologist, and his dad told me that they, they cried when uh, Michael came back from college in six weeks and dropped out and said all of his teachers were idiots. And it's amazing how all of my idols dropped out of college. This is a big dispute my wife and I are having because we have four kids. And I say, well, Michael Dell dropped out of college. Uh, your brother has the second largest construction company in Kansas. He dropped out of college. Um, Bill Gates dropped out of college. In fact, pretty much it's a proven fact that in the last 20 years, if you graduate from college, you won't be a billionaire, okay? Because if you go in a little brick building and listen to people who have never had a business or an employee, um, you're probably not going to be too innovative. And uh, Southwest Airlines, I buy stocks. You know, I don't buy Dell. I bought Michael Dell. I did not buy Intel. I'm buying into Andy Grove. I do not buy Microsoft stock. I'm betting on Bill Gates. I am not buying Pixar stock or Apple stock. I still think Steve Jobs is a, just a genius extraordinaire and ran one of the greatest second acts in business in the history of business. Um, I buy stocks on, I'm betting my money on the man. You can get confused in all the P&Ls and profits, but some of those men are such legends of economic productivity. And you know, here, here's Michael Dell. He's worth $35 billion. And what does he do 12 hours a day, seven days a week? Works his butt off with passion. He loves it. Look at Herb Kelleher, Southwest Airline. He's an attorney who doesn't have his pilot's license, drinks wild turkey straight on ice all day long, smokes three or four packs a day. When I met him one time, he got his wild turkey down about halfway, puts it in front of a turkey, pulls the head, tops it off, takes a sip, goes to light a cigarette, and forgets that he already has a lit cigarette in his mouth. While he's talking about how easy it is to lower your cost and get people to afford, him to, afford to fly, and his costs are seven and a half cents a seat mile through the air, and here's U.S. Scare, which eventually, you know, is going under and merging with American Airlines. I don't understand why America West would want to marry um, the highest cost, most retarded company in the world. It's like when a really smart person marries a really dumb person, there's trouble ahead. I wish America West would have married Southwest. That would have been smart. But buy stocks on the man. Buy stocks on who has the lowest cost in the industry. The low-cost leader is going to make a lot of money. Look at Walmart stocks. Every one of those triangles is a split. And every time I go to a dental convention, they always talk about Nordstrom's, 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 Nordstrom's. If I wrote a paper on how brilliant Nordstrom's is at ASU when I was getting my master's in business, um, they probably would have thought, um, they, they would have thought I was crazy. I mean, what do they have? Two triangles to Walmart. How many uh, does Walmart have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And Nordstrom's uh, um, has two pretty much three traveling sideways. Um, Nordstrom's also, um, you think Walmart is cruel and unusual. Um, you ever um, heard of Nordstrom's? Um, there's a uh, Prax Management Consultant friend of mine um, in Oregon, Judith, what's his name? Uh, the guy we gave a ride from Tucson to the airport. Oh, Bill, Blatchford. Bill Blatchford. His daughter worked for Nordstrom's for five years before she finally quit and went to dental school. You know what they do at Nordstrom's each, according to Bill Blatchford? is each department at the end of the month they tally up everyone's sales they're only paid commission and whoever has the least sales they fire and you think walmart's cruel and unusual i mean Nordstrom, if no matter what i mean there's five people and you all had great sales doesn't matter who's ever the lowest gets fired and they're always firing the bottom person in sales from each department each month to keep the sales pressure high look at southwest airlines i mean it looks like a triangle factory one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and here's uh, northwest airlines and, uh, you know, and you go to Southwest and, um, you know, they're wearing khakis and tennis shoes and just have a T-shirt on. And you think they don't look professional. Here's Northwest Airlines. They're all in black high-heeled shoes and pantyhose and skirts and dresses and makeup and fingernails. And when your plane's on fire, who would you rather uh, throw you out of an airplane? Some girl in khakis and Nikes or someone in high-heeled shoes? I mean, their whole business model doesn't even make sense. And here with Southwest Airlines... By lowering their costs, grandma has the freedom to afford to fly halfway across the country to go to her daughter's, her granddaughter's first communion or grandson's first bar mitzvah or granddaughter's first bat mitzvah. I mean, by lowering costs, grandma has the freedom to afford to go visit her family and friends and relatives. And by keeping costs high over at U.S. Scare, grandma can't see her daughter's first communion. So Southwest Airlines 
is the more virtuous airline. Here we're talking about dental average incomes for dentists. Uh, the top line is physicians, 1970. They were about 160, dentists were about 100. And with the advent of HMOs and uh, all the government intervention in healthcare, the physicians started making less than the dentist in 1993. And it just continues to go. And for, from 93 to 2002, um, dentists now make more money than physicians. But what's bizarre about that is the hours worked. I mean, here's these poor physicians doing over 60 on average, and here's their dentist country club golfing buddies um, pulling in a whopping 32. So uh, dental schools, supply and demand. I mean, economics in three words is supply and demand. And what has dentists been doing? Closing down the supply. I mean, this is one of the best protected trade unions in the country. Uh, they closed down Oral Roberts University because uh, God wouldn't give them more money. And then they closed down Emory. Here's Georgia, one of the fastest growing best states in the world. And Georgia closes down Emory. And then here's Georgetown, Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. They closed down a dental school. Farley Dixon, New Jersey, huge state. Um, Washington University in St. Louis, the Gateway to the West, closed down their dental school. Loyola University, Chicago, um, Northwestern University. And at that same time, they've only opened up two, and of course, um, or three. One was Nova in Miami, but you got to look closer at Nova. Nova is a university with a lot of people coming from Central and South America, and going back to some South America, Arizona and Nevada both opened up dental school in 2003 and 2004. And living out here in Arizona, you should have heard the mentality of the dentist. I mean, you would have thought that the dean of the dental school was Satan or Lucifer or was coming. A, you know, I mean, it was outrageous, the remarks that the dentists were saying about a great state of Arizona, six million more people. We got the same number of people as Hong Kong. We got twice as many as Singapore. Um, here's a country of six million people and the local dentist didn't think they should have a dental school. I mean, what, I mean, what, what are you thinking? Um, here's the number of dental school applicants versus number of dental school students. Uh, we know there was a huge surge. Um, dentistry started out with about, um, 3,800. Uh, well, we go back to 1940. You only had about 2000 applicants by 1950 after World War II, it jumped to about 3,800. It slightly rose up to above uh, to 6,000 by 82, and then it's been drifting down ever since. Uh, look at the number of applicants. In the 75s, it was very high. Now it's starting to go high again. I mean, dentistry is an incredibly lucrative job. Where else can you work 30 hours a week for $150,000 a year? I mean, and heck, 38 hours, 32 hours a week, a week has 168 hours. So when you work 32, what's 168 minus 32? Listen to the deafening silence from the camera crew. 168 minus 32. Anybody? Take a stab at it. No one. And uh, 100, you still got 120 hours. You could have three more jobs after you got done being a dentist. And uh, you could have one, a couple of jobs just for fun. And um, dental degrees earned from 1955 to 2002. This is a kind of a sad chart, but uh, um, total um, is going down. Starting in 1995 was the first year that the country, the great country, United States of America, has more dentists retire than come out of dental school. We're having about 5,000 a year retire and about 3,800 a year, let's say 4,000 come out of school. So every year, the country of the United States raises its population about 3 million, but the whole country as a whole loses another 1,000 dentists. And this has been going on since 1995. And we have another demographic trend, uh, men versus women. It used to be, in 1955, literally all the dentists were men all the way to 1975. A lot of sexism in the past history of the United States. Um, when I got to school in 1980, if you were a girl and you had a 4.0 in honors classes, they told you to be a nurse. If you're a boy with a 3.2, Barely cut in an honors class or not in an honors class, they told you to be a physician. I saw that, it was unbelievable. They told the smartest girls in the class to be nurses and hygienists and uh, mediocre boys to be physicians, dentists, and lawyers. Well, now women caught on that there's more money being a dentist than a um, hygienist or a physician than a nurse. And so now women are up to just about 40% um, about of the class size and men are down to about 60. And most of the deans I talk to say, based on applications, There'll be more women than men in med school, dental school, and law school within 10 years because due to women's earlier 
um, menarche and coming into hormonal, um, they're kind of settled down by college, whereas men are late to have their hormonal puberty. And that's why men from coast to coast, freshman year of college, do about a half GPA point lower than females because by the time they get let out of the house or in a testosterone rush and they go to college, there's girls and beer, and they kind of go crazy the first year um, or two or three. And uh, so basically, um, the, the key fact of the women, though, is they actually work less hours. Um, they're trying to play um, mom and dentist and professional, um, and a lot of the men are still acting like they did in World War II, where the men just go to work and uh, don't do anything domestic. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of currently at my home is that um, I actually do more loads of laundry and dryer and loads in the dishwasher than my wife. That is a fact, no matter what she tells you. And, uh, but I'm trying to um, be domestic. Uh, I always say I'm Martha Stewart with, uh, with an extra. And, uh, but the bottom line is um, we're having a thousand less dentists in the country each year and the mix of dentists, more women than men, so their total productivity will be less. So, I mean, dentistry is an incredibly lucrative profession. So just because you can charge 900 for a crown and get it, doesn't really mean it's a fair deal. Uh, it's maybe a good deal for you, but is it a good deal for the community? Is it a good deal for your patients? Is it a good deal for the insurance companies? Is it good for the United States? Um, if it's not good for the United States of America, it's not good for you. Um, one physician, look at the physicians, one physician per 374 people, um, one specialist per physician for every thousand, one primary care physician for every 735, but look at dentists, one dentist for every 1,837 people. That's only one dentist for every 2,000 people. That's not enough dentists. And look at the, look at the degrees that this country's uh, uh, passing. From 1955 to 2002, the number of law degrees went up fourfold from 8,000 to 38,000. This country has a million attorneys, whereas physicians went from 7,500 to 15,000. Dentists actually have 200 dentists graduating a year less than they did in 1955. And every single person has teeth, but not every single person needs to sue someone. And uh, it's just a, cre it's literally insane that they're uh, still opening up law schools, expanding law schools. Um, Phoenix, Arizona just opened up an evening law school program. Um, unbelievable. So remember, economics in three words is supply and demand. You've cut the supply of dentistry. Um, the patient's demand has gone up to now everyone wants to keep their teeth. Everyone needs ortho. Everyone wants whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. So your demand has skyrocketed. Your supply has plummeted. So just because you can make $150,000 a year on 32 hours is more a factor of supply and demand, not you. So don't read all your own press clippings and think you're too great. Think and realize that you're in a sweet deal and you got to make this deal sweeter for the bottom 40 million Americans who can't get into a dental office, they can't afford it. And remember the five A's of healthcare, availability, accessibility, affordability. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Cami. I'm Howard's executive assistant and I'm here to introduce the virtue of frugalness. Lower your overhead with economy and simplicity of style and without being miserly. Howard. Thank you, Cammie. Now, for those of you who watched the 30-day dental MBA five or six years ago, Cammie was pregnant. And as you saw, she's still pregnant five or six years later. So cross your fingers that one day it'll drop. But uh, many of you who email me and... Um, Cammy does all my email, so uh, a lot of times when you think you're talking to me, it's really Cammy. And uh, but the virtue of frugality, I want you to remember that as we talked about earlier, you have to design frugality up front. You can't sit there and do a crown, then just wonder how you're going to lower your costs. Um, for and it's just little things. Um, the thing that's sad about operation logistics is you're always thinking you're going to learn some big sexy silver secret recipe and it's gonna drastically lower your cost, and that's not the way it works. You cut your cost 50% by finding 50 little boring operational logistic things that when add up, give you a significant cost advantage. For instance, so many dentists will prepare a crown, and after they prepare the crown, they 
pack the cord. Well, in preparing the crown, they might have nicked the tissue, start bleeding. Now they're spending time as money, and you only manage people time and money, and you're, you're spending all this time managing the bleeding because you didn't pack the cord first. Now, a lot of dentists tell me, well, how can you pack the cord first? Well, if you can floss the tooth, you can pack the cord first. But by packing the cord, you push the gum tissue down and out. We place a zero cord by Ultradent. That pushes the gum a little bit down and out. Then we pass back another one cord. Um, so when I have a tooth uh, that I'm going to do a crown, the, high, the assistant will seat them. The assistant will take a temporary for the final um, um, temporary, an impression of the final temporary. Um, <clears throat> she'll call one of the hygienists over to numb the tooth. Uh, the tooth gets numb. And then the assistant packs a zero and a one cord. When I get in there, the gums are down and out. And sometimes you, um, you know, like you'd be cutting off this crown and a 10 year old porcelain crown with interproximal flossing decay and you would nick the gum and cause it to bleed. But look at this gum tissue, how infected this was by packing a zero and a one, how much you've pushed the gum tissue down and out. And so we don't deal with bleeding because we pack the cord before we prep the crown. Um, so all these little things, they sound boring and insignificant, but when you add them up, um, time is money. Here's an emergency toothache and the gums are swollen. Here it is after you pack the cord. You learn a lot about what's going on with the periodontium um, by seeing what the cord does with it. Um, think another thing, porcelain onlays. You want to do all porcelain restorations. Well, what's going on? You're, you're in the back of the mouth. Come on, you're in molars. There's no light in the molars. I got 10 floodlights on me. Look at my mouth. You can't even see back there. And you're talking about translucency and shade, and you're trying all these different colored cements. Come on, you're, you're crazy. You're taking yourself too serious. Quit taking yourself so serious. When you do an all porcelain restoration, it's 10 times weaker with a higher fracture rate than like a porcelain to gold, like a CapTech onlay. Furthermore, when I cement a CapTech onlay, I don't need to numb the tooth. I just mix up in a simple 3M's Vitramir. I can cement that porcelain onlay in five minutes. I only need 15 minutes chair time. Cement in five minutes. If I would have chosen all porcelain restoration, now I wouldn't need to numb up the tooth. Now I need to place a rubber dam. I might even need to pack cord. I might need an hour to cement a porcelain inlay. What happens to my cost when I use an hour to cement an all porcelain inlay versus when I do a porcelain to gold and now I only need 15 minutes and the porcelain to gold lasts longer and you don't choose that because you think the all porcelain looks better and it does all in your photography and when you got a bunch of lights in the back of the mouth. But when mom and dad come in and get an onlay and say, well, can I have it be porcelain instead of gold? Well, they just want something white and they look at their and see it's white. They go, oh, that looks nice. They don't understand translucency. The back of the mouth is a hollow cavity. I mean, come on, that molar is closer to their tonsils than it is the front of their mouth. Most people, when you get done seating it, you say, how does it look? And they open up their mouth and they ask you which one it is. You know, they're looking in the mouth saying which one it is, and you're telling me you have to go through this aesthetic health compromise of weaker porcelain that doesn't last as long because it's not aesthetic enough, and yet the patients don't even know which one it is. So here's the onlay. I mean, just clean the prep and seat it. When you want to be frugal, I still think that, you know, if you have a marriage problem, you know, what are they always telling you about? It's communication, 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 usually about sex or money, something like that. But it's communication, communication, communication. Um, my biggest failure, you know, we talk about our successes. Real men talk about their failures with humility and humbleness. But I remember reading um, psychology with the Roshark inkblot test clear back in 1980 when I was a psychology major at Creighton University. And you know, row shark ink blot test, they would drop an ink, a drop of ink into a piece of paper, fold it in half, open it back up so there's no human design or anything. And they'd hold it up and they'd show it to someone and say, What do you see? And they showed you this ink blot and you said, All right, uh, two people machine gunning down a dog with a machine gun. They think, Wow, that's a weird, dark thought. You're, you have depression. And they showed the ink blot to someone else. They said, I see two butterflies kissing. And they thought, Well, that's a happy thought. So basically, they were, they were learning how to pull information out of the unconscious. Is this person saying happy thoughts or sad thoughts? And they started applying it with prediction models um, to whether or not married people would be married or divorced in five years. They would say, they would say um, tell me 
about your staff, I mean about your wife or your spouse, and you say, well, my friends, her friends, my night out, her night out, my vacation, her vacation, my parents, her parents, um, you know, and you keep talking about these two separate units, they say, look at the choice of words coming out of their unconscious. <clears throat> They're not even married. They're just two separate circles held together by an artificial ring or a contract. These people are going to drift apart. Then they go to another couple. Oh, our friends, our checking, our vacation, our house, our hobby, our bowling. And they say, my God, listen to these two people talk. They don't even see themselves as separate people. They see this one union. These people couldn't even separate. They, they wouldn't even know how to separate. And so, you know, the words you choose about your wife, your spouse, your staff, well, for 15 years, actually, it's more embarrassing than that. It was about 18 years. For 18 years, <clears throat> I would have four front office, four hygienists, four assistants with me and another dentist. And I would always have the same thing. Uh, well, the front office did this. And here's my front office. And they say, well, the assistants do this. And there's my forces, and they'd say, and the four hygienists, they do this. And it was, it was the hygienist versus the assistants versus the front office. And I would have staff meetings, and I'd take them to lunch, and we'd do functions and parties. And no matter what I did, at the end of the day, it was three different circles. The front, the back, the hygienist. The front, the back, the hygienist. And I said, these people, the words they choose, they, they don't even work as a team. And everything I did, I couldn't get to work as a team. And then I realized <clears throat> these people were geographically separated. The front's all in the front. Four hygienists, they're all, they're all uh, the assistants are all in rooms five. Um, Amy's in, uh, Colleen's in five, Amy's in six, Jan's in seven, Chris's in eight. You know, the hygienist, Janet's in one, uh, Christine's two, Corey's three, Kim's four. And they were geographically separated. And then an, a hygienist by the name of Amy Cody, who is now the uh, assistant editor to Hygiene Town Magazine, which is mailed to 80,000 hygienists in 38 countries, um, turned me on to Motorola Walkie Talks. She said, Howard, you gotta get these. They're like 70 bucks a piece. And after your morning huddle, everybody gets wired to these Motorola Walkie Talkies. And then it's communication, communication, communication. They're all talking to each other. Now listen to this, what would happen. <clears throat> Here's what happened in the old days. You would get, you would get a, um, the front office go in there and you open at 8 and they get there at 7.30 and they hear that your 9 o'clock hygiene is canceled. Well, what are you going to do in an hour to get someone down there? And when they hear that on the phone, they would just go on the walk down and say, um, Corey, your 9 o'clock canceled. Well, now you got four assistants and they're all seeing people for crown seats or uh, whatever, a filling or this or that. And all four of them instantly go to their schedule and see which patient of theirs are coming in for a crown seat or um, a filling or whatever that needs a cleaning. And then maybe the first, and then maybe, uh, maybe um, no one does. But they get uh, the next mess on AMC is at nine o'clock, um, you have an emergency. See, the hygienist's nightmare is a cancellation, a no-show, broken appointment. The assistant's nightmare is a walk-in, an emergency, a toothache. And we only hire hygienists who used to be dental assistants. Um, I have found it completely um, no luck at all when they leave high school, go straight to hygiene school, and come in and become a hygienist, um, they're just not cross-trained. And, the, you know, Christine was a dental assistant uh, for five, six years. Corey was four or five years. She, um, Kim was years. Janet was years. And they get a cancellation, broken appointment, no-show, and the front office gets a walk-in emergency. These people will seat them, take the necessary x-rays, pee in a bite wing. Sometimes they'll just do a new patient exam, take an FMX chart existing, do their perio probe, determine what cleaning they need on a perio one, two, three, four, five. I mean, it's just outstanding. But since they're talking all day long, just those 12s and the doctor off, because they're the team and I'm the doctor, I'm the owner, and I don't think the dentist should be involved. They should be focusing on their dentistry, focusing on their patients. And, you know, it's just in their left ear. And, they, and, and within a week of implementing Motorola walkie-talkies, within one week, they were sitting there saying, oh, you guys, we got a cancellation at 9, or hey guys, we got a broken appointment at 10, or hey guys, we're not going to make gold, we're, you know, we try to do a thousand bucks an hour, and we're going to end the day at 7, you know, I mean, it's just unbelievable how it turned three circles into one just by breaking down geographical barriers by wiring them to Motorola walkie-talkies, and I've never met an office that went to Motorola walkie-talkies and went back. And a lot of dentists will say, yeah, but you got this big, crazy office, and, you know, we're just, 
one receptionist, one hygienist, one assistant man. We don't need all that. And no, that's exactly wrong, doctor. That's not true. Your reception's up there. Someone on the phone just canceled 11. She's got someone checking out, someone checking in. She does not have time to run back there and tell everybody what's going on. And so you got a cancellation 11, just called at 1045. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make my 11 o'clock. I'm sorry. Well, great. You know, give me 15 minutes. Thanks a lot, you know. And uh, she tries to reschedule it. But she can cover the deal and say, you know, your 11 o'clock just canceled. Well, you're back there, doctor, and you had a patient from 10 to 11. You're doing a crown number three, and you were just getting done at a quarter till, and you're just getting ready to finish up and let the patient go. But your assistant just heard your 11 o'clock canceled, and your assistant just points to the schedule and say 11 o'clock canceled. And now immediately you can look at the patient and say, now, now friend, Sam, look, you haven't been in for three years. Uh, we got you in, you know, we're doing this crown day at number three, and we took the impression, we'll get that back in two weeks. But you know what? You still got two fillings over here. And, you know, I'm looking at your x-rays, and you've had, like, four root canals because a little bitty flossing cavity that could have been fixed with a filling. You know, it wasn't caught in time, grew into the nerve, toothache, multi-thousand root canal building crown. I've got you here. You're on your back. You want to just keep going? I've got time. I can numb up these two and just keep going. Then you'll come in two weeks, have the crown seat be done. And they'll use it and say, you know what? You got me. I'm here. Let's just keep going. And you're, but in the old day, you didn't have that instant communication. Your front office couldn't run back there and tell you. So now you get the patient on a chair and they're all walking up at front. And then as you're saying goodbye to the patient, then your receptionist tells you, oh, by the way, doctor, your next patient is canceled. Well, now it's kind of awkward to say, well, Frank, uh, <laughs> you're already halfway out the door. You want to turn around and come back and sit back down again? They're like, no, 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 I've had enough. I'm really done. And uh, I mean, it's just communication and communication, communication. Doesn't, married, doesn't matter if you're just married. Married with one kid, four kids, ten kids, you need communication. Your staff needs to talk from the front to the back to the hygienist. And it doesn't matter if you have one of each, two of each, three of each, or a dozen of each. Communication is the key. And uh, those are the best assistants, the best hygienists. They really are. Everybody's supposed to wear their uniform. And one of them, Kim, uh, didn't get the right uniform on. So we decided to shoot again the next day. And there she is again in the wrong uniform. And, uh, but they're the greatest. Also, try to upsell every order. When you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, what is the first thing their minimum wage employees say? Um, would you like fries with that? Do you like cookies with that? When someone orders a cleaning exam and x-rays, what is the first thing you could say? Um, you know, um, when you get done cleaning your teeth, have you thought about whitening? You know, the best time to whiten your teeth is after a cleaning. You got all the plaque, calculus, tartar off. That's when the bleach can get right on your teeth, have its maximum effect. You know, the word doctor is a noun from the Latin word um, doctor, which means teacher, docere, uh, the Latin word doctor, um, docere, to teach. And when I'm in a dental office, I have often thought that the best teachers were not the doctors. A lot of times it's long-term assistants, it's hygienist. And you know, if you walk behind your hygienist cleaning a teeth for an hour and you could hear a pin drop, she's not a doctor. But if you walk behind your hygienist and she's always talking about gum disease and perio and teaching and informing the difference between implants and bridges, then your hygienist is a doctor. Anyone who teaches is a Latin docere to teach a doctor. And so many doctors are introvert and shy and they're not really good doctors. They might have great surgical skills, but a doctor is a Latin word teacher, not surgeon. And the bottom line is, so many odd times I've told the doctor, I say, you know, you're kind of shy, you're kind of introvert, you don't like sales, you know, you really don't like to talk much, you feel bad, yada, yada, yada. I said, let's let um, this hygienist or this assistant present the treatment. And then I say, no, I don't want to, I'm the doctor, I should be doing this. And I'll say, well, you know, management's measurements. Why don't you present, you know, I've got data on your treatment plan acceptance rate and your average new patient conversion rate. Because remember, in healthcare, if you don't sell them, on the vaccine, little Megan might get meningitis. I mean, if you don't sell them on the vaccine, she might get hepatitis um, A or B. I mean, when you don't sell health care, your patients get more disease. So it's more than just your ego trip doctor. It's who can sell the most number of vaccines, sealants, cleanings, root planing, peri uh, root, all that stuff. So I'll sit there and say, okay, I've been in doctor's offices where the average new patient generates $400 of dentistry. And I'll put an assistant on it for a week and she'll do 1200. And then the doctor after a week won't let her do it anymore because he really feels that he should do it because he's a doctor. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. That, that's when your ego is overriding the best interest of what your patients need. Whoever can be 
the best teacher is the best doctor. Um, we believe a lot of things in dentistry that aren't necessarily true. Like hygienists always want to have eight patients on an eight hour day. And then their patients will call up and they can't get in for six weeks. So what we would do is we'd either add, raise the price or add capacity or increase the speed. I mean, those are your only three choices. Increase price, which is putting the brake in, or hit the gas, increase, add another hygienist or have them go faster. And let's say we raise the price from 70 to 80. 70 dollars on eight hour day is 560, but we have no capacity. Raise the price to 80, now on a seven hour days, we still get 560, but we've got 12 and a half percent capacity. We got one hour open on eight hour days. So when someone calls them and says, yeah, I'm really, really busy and I just got the afternoon off. I'm a lawyer. We just finished up our case and we're gonna start a new case on Monday, but I've just got today and uh, today we just, you know, I'm gonna go do my dry cleaners. I'm gonna try to get my teeth clean. I gotta see my chiropractor. And can I get in today? And you just say, no, no, I'm sorry. I gotta wait two or three weeks. And then the person doesn't come back for years and years. So I explain this like a go-kart. And this is called line queuing theory. When people get in line, you don't put people in line because it's dysfunctional. Uh, when people are in line, you're not giving them a chance to pay more to get to the front of the line. Uh, when people are in line, you're encouraging them to get out of your line and get into someone else's line. So you either hit the brake and raise your prices. And what that does is the people who really want to see you the most will get to see you. Or you hit the gas and add more chairs, extend your hours, or you go faster. You build, you know, when you have apex locators and 300 RPM night ties, um, you can do root canals in half the time as you can doing it by taking x-rays of your working length and hand filing with a bunch of files. So basically, um, we don't put people in line. The only places you see lines, if you, I've traveled to 38 countries. The only two industries you see a line in is the government and healthcare. For instance, if I went to London and I got off the plane on a Sunday morning at 10, I'd say, I'd like to get a driver's license and a cleaning. They'd all laugh. Well, oh, you can't do that. And I'd say, uh, I'd say, I just want a driver's license and cleaning. They'd say, it's impossible. But if I said, okay, I want an AK-47, a bag of weed, a gram of cocaine, you, you could buy anything you wanted in London except a driver's license and a cleaning by a hygienist. I mean, as long as government or healthcare or education is not involved, the three great industries that just destroy capital, you can have anything you want. You can get three redheads jump out of a cake. I mean, anything you want except a cleaning and a driver's license and anything from a school. Um, so the bottom line is really, really think about what you're doing. Um, we base a lot of our operation and logistics of Henry Ford. Um, he lived 1863 to 1947 and was the founder of the Ford Motor Company in 1903. And Henry Ford revolutionized the automobile industry with the assembly line method of production. And he really added tremendous wealth. He was able to cut uh, literally 50% of the human man hours to assemble a car um, by using standardized parts, which came from Germany, predated Germany, about 1860 was when the Germans realized, my God, why do we have a different size screw for everything that needs a screw in the world? I mean, we have 3,000 different kinds of screws. If we just came out with 10 screws, my God, we, that just would make everything simpler. So the Germans figured out standardized parts. Well, as soon as they figured out standardized parts, that gave way to America, Henry Ford, 1903, who was a German, to figure, <coughs> to figure out the assembly line that if everything was a standardized part you could have mass assembly now isn't that amazing how that industry that knowledge a hundred years ago has been lost today on the electronics industry do you know how many different types of batteries there are today if Henry Ford was alive today he'd say look here's 10 batteries anything that needs a battery here's 10 batteries start from here and everything would be cheaper you know, your TV remote control could go dead, but then you go pull something out of one of your kids' games or whatever, and no matter what, if your battery went dead, you could just grab any other gadget and it'd probably have one of these 10 batteries that you need. Today, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kinds of batteries and laser inkjet printer cartridges. And you know why they do these? A lot of them do it because they don't understand it'd lower their costs. But a lot of them do it because it's kind of the, the old trick, we'll give you the shaver for free and then we'll sell you the blades. And if the blades only fit my shaver, um, I've kind of locked you in. Well, they do that today. A lot of these companies, 
actually break even or practically give away uh, the digital camera. Um, but every time the battery runs out and you're back there saying, oh my God, these batteries are like $45. Yeah, that's where they make all their profit. So a lot of times you, before you buy an electronic device, you ought to look at the battery they're using and its replacement cost because if you're going to use it for five or 10 years, you're going to pay all the money out in uh, these batteries. Um, it's a scandal. It really is. Um, but excellent. The assembly line is excellent for standard products with a low variance where every product comes out the same. But that is not what we see in a service industry. The service industry guru, the Henry Ford genius of manufacturing in the service sector was actually Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. Ray Kroc lived from 1902 to 1984. A lot of people say he's the founder of McDonald's in 1954. Well, that's, that's, that, that really is uh, true. That, that's like finding the, force and, uh, finding the tree and missing the forest. Ray Kroc invented the franchise. He invented, um, and he followed uh, um, basically President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who over when he was in World War II and he was fighting uh, Nazi Germany, he was so impressed at how these major Autobahns could move troops around so fast and how hard it was in America to get something from Washington, D.C. down to New Orleans or a base in Florida. And he came back when he took president, he said, the first thing we need to do is we need to build a national interstate system. So they built these massive interstates from coast to coast, and that's why to this day you'll see when you're on an interstate, every fifth mile doesn't have any lights beside it, and the cement's a little deeper and thicker, so you can land aircraft and fighter aircraft. Every fifth mile of interstate is military runways, and they sit there and they build all these interstates. Well, that's with the interstates. Then people decided before the interstates, before World War II, most people born, lived, raised, died, never went 100 miles away from home. And now all of a sudden people are waking up in Wichita, Kansas, and Omaha, Nebraska, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and saying, well, hell, Henry, we could, we could just drive to Disneyland. It might take us a couple days, but let's just, hell, let's just do it. We got a week off. And they get in those big old station wagons and all the kids, I can remember me and my five sisters, sitting in the back of the station wagons playing Monopoly and Battleship from Wichita to Disneyland and back. No seat belts, you know, hundreds of pillows, blankets. And um, now when you leave your house 100 miles away from home, you know, if you pull up to some diner um, to go to the bathroom, the bathroom would look like some camel just used it. Um, if you went into the diner and had a um, chicken fried steak, it wouldn't be anything that you're used to. Everything would taste funny, finicky, and Ray Crux said, my God, when these people leave home, they're going to want the same bat station, the same bat channel, the same. He said, there'll be no such thing as good food. It'll be food that they're used to. So if we stamp out a franchise where anywhere you go to McDonald's, a Big Mac will taste exactly the same with two Obi Pays, plus sauce, cheese, plus honey, sussy bun, this will have massive value. And today, franchises account for 13% of our GDP. And where are the monuments to Ray Kroc, who now, his invention of a franchise is now 13% of our $11 trillion economy. In fact, that's the same size of the not-for-profit sector, like the American Dental Association, America. every trade group has their nonprofit association, and nonprofits are 13% of GDP, and so are franchises. This is all coming from Ray Kroc, and Ray Kroc said, when you're building a standardized product, you can measure how much demand is out there for the whole market and say Ford realized, okay, he's going to build uh, 10 million cars in 20 years. You can build an assembly line that will stamp out exact products where your total aggregate supply equals your total aggregate demand. But Ray said a service sector is not like that. You have to match the flow to the demand because people don't come in every five and a half or seven minutes and order french fries. You get a big wave at breakfast and then nothing, then a big wave at lunch, then nothing, big wave at dinner, then nothing. And you have to match flow with demand, not total capacity with demand. So instead of supply and demand, this is flow and demand. And that's why restaurants do things where they try to use economic incentives to move some of this excess demand at dinner down in here where no one wants it, like the restaurants will have the early bird specials. Well, let's say if you come in with blue hair and eat between four and seven or four and five, it's, it'd be uh, two meals for the price of one. Uh, movie theaters do it on Saturdays. They know Saturday night everything's going to sell out. 
So what do they do? They say, well, come in at the 12 o'clock and the 2 o'clock and the 4 o'clock show, and it's half price. I'll put little brackets around the time. They're trying to use economic incentives to move excess demand into excess supply capacity. And uh, banks do this. 168 hours in a week. Uh, this is bank one across the street. By the way, probably the two best employees I've had in the last 20 years, uh, Danielle and Jamie, came from bank. You know, bank people are very analytical. I've noticed so many times people hire receptionists and they're, they're all excited because she's got five years experience in another dental office. And I'll say, what, um, what computer system they use? And they say, oh, it was SoftDent by Kodak. And I'll say, yeah, did Kodak have five, 10, 20, or 50 reports? Oh, I don't know. I don't really know. You know, the doctor didn't give us enough training. I always thought we should have more training. And I'm like, come on, you sat there at a computer? 365 days a year for five years, you were there what? Four times, you're there nearly 20,000 days and you never just had enough something in your head to just kind of reach up and click reports and just look at it? I mean, weren't you ever just kind of bored? And it's just a different breed of person. I mean, you're right brain or left brain. And right brain are artsy fartsy and they're creative and they like to do designs and they're all into, you know, that type of stuff. But people who come from a bank, Dentists, engineers, finance, accounting. These are left brain people. These are analytical. These are people. My Danielle, the first one I got out of Bank One, I dropped her off at the front office. Too busy to train her. You know, we were going to come back to that. She, she every, every time I saw her, uh, I noticed there was 50 reports. I noticed you run these, but you don't run these. And I mean, she just kept asking me analytical decisions. She had to ask me the dental terms, like what's MOD and what's a root canal and this and that. But it took me about, you know, a couple of weeks to explain to the dental side. But the analytical side, she just figured out because she's a left brain person. Um, I would much rather have a receptionist from Bank One, which is now, I guess, Chase or JP Morgan Chase. Um, by the way, I love Bank One because my favorite finance CEO was, um, uh, well, Jamie Dimon, but he used to work, he trained under Sandy Weil. And Sandy with Citibank was just, I mean, J you had JP Morgan. When Morgan died, the finance community was so shaken up and lost such a huge leader, they literally had to create the Federal Reserve to replace what JP Morgan had been doing naturally for 40 years. Every time there's a run on banks and a financial crisis and a calamity, Morgan was a leader who showed everyone how to get out of this as our country was growing so fast and had millions of immigrants a year. When Morgan died, I believe in 13, by 1919, they started the Federal Reserve just to replace Morgan. And believe it or not, Sandy Weil of Citibank um, is the only heir apparent there could be. He's a finance genius. His boy junior was uh, Jamie Dimon, who uh, basically Citibank wasn't big enough for both of them, and, and he went to Chase, I mean uh, Bank One, which then bought Chase. No, did they buy Chase? No, they bought a, who'd Bank One buy? Was it Chase? Chase. That's right, it was Chase. And, uh, but anyway, I just, I love Jamie Dimon. Um, we're the same age. The guy's just a financial genius. I really believe, a thousand years now, they'll say DuPont, Sandy Weil, Jamie Dimon. I mean, he's just unbelievable. But the people that come out of these banks are so analytical, and they're just they're just brilliant people. And uh, now I got a new one out of there named Jamie. And uh, and what's Jamie Dimon? What's Dimon's first name? Jamie. And I got a Jamie from Bank One. So Jamie, are you going to be as hot as Jamie Dimon? Hotter. All right. And uh, so, but notice that there's 168 hours in a week. And they only need three lanes on Fridays from noon to six o'clock. So they have three lanes because they need three lanes for Friday afternoons, but for the remaining 160 hours a week, they don't need these two lanes. But see, they've matched their capacity to the flow, not capacity to total aggregate demand. Same thing in the bookstore. You go into a bookstore and there's no one in there. And all the employees are putting away books and vacuuming and opening up inventory and straightening up and fronting shelves. And then all of a sudden the big movie lets out. And all of a sudden a big flow, a big wave of apes comes in. And you'll see someone that sees the wave come through the doors and they'll say, I need all checkers to the front, all checkers to the front. A big wave of apes just came in. And everybody drops what they're doing and they come man eight stations because if they put a whole bunch of patients in line and you're standing there and there's eight people in front of you and it's 11 o'clock at night and the 
Only person in the cash register has a bar through their tongue, a bone through their eyelash, um, um, four tattoos, and you're looking and your wife's saying, you know, I told the babysitter we'd be home at 11, it's 11.15. Why don't you put the book down and I'll order it tonight on Amazon.com and make Jeff Bezos another buck. Um, but see, they know that, so they don't put you in line. They have capacity to match the flow. So we sit there and, you know, patience, today's patience will not be patient. The word patient comes from the old saying, please be patient. The doctor will be with you in a while, and I kid you not on that. And so here's our office. It's 4,000 square feet. Here's the front office. Here's the waiting room. We're, we're asking people to be patient. Here's the um, receptionist. Here's the office manager. Here's the four hygienist. Here's the four dentist. Here's central sterilization. Here's a pano. Here's break room. And um, everything that happens is designed. Our capacity meets the flow. So here's an issue that shows how we deal with, the, um, with management. Imagine you're in a basketball game. And the opposing team scores 10 points to your zero. Most people would call a timeout. Okay, that's when you need to manage. Not 30 days later at a staff meeting say, oh, by the way, 30 days ago we were playing a game and they had a 10 point to zero run on us. We lost the game. The time to call a timeout is now. And so I'm sitting here in room eight and I notice the hygienist is very upset. And basically, so I stop and I call timeout and I say, what, what's going on? It says, well, I had a cancellation, so we had an emergency patient. They needed FMX. I took FMX. I went back to our AT2000 developer, and uh, someone from the front office was locked in there duplicating x-rays for insurance. So I went to our backup AT2000 developer, and one of your assistants had a cancellation. And she's in there cleaning the developer. And it just really put me behind five or ten minutes, and it just really upset me. So I think, okay, that's a design problem, and I'm measuring the steps in seconds, thinking, all they need for developers is a water and a drain. And so water and drain developer, water drain developer. We'll put another one right here. All the hygienists can see it'll just be theirs. And so I figure that out and I get all ready. I tell my uh, <coughs> supply person from Henry Schein, uh, Chris Powell, I need a third AT2000 developer. And he said, oh, Howard, come on. I mean, where, where you had one, now you had two, now you have three. What are we going to do? Put one in each room? I think it's really time to go digital. So, uh, so I went digital. I went trophy. Um, I went with Trophy because it had half the market around the world, and um, plus I was already running Soft End, um, but Dentrix would have been a great choice. EagleSoft would have been a great choice. I, I actually can't see the difference between Dentrix, EagleSoft, and Soft End. I think um, I would leverage an existing relationship. You buy from Patterson, I get EagleSoft. You buy from Shine, I get Dentrix. Uh, you buy from uh, Benco or Burkhart, maybe you want Soft End. Uh, but you know, it's the service over the, I mean, if you're going to have a practicing software in your office for 10 years, trust me, the cost is not going to be the price of software. It's going to be the support over the next decade. So if you buying your existing, all your supplies from Shine, uh, leverage that relationship for better service on your Dentrix. Uh, or if you buy all your stuff from Patterson, leverage that account to get better service through EagleSoft. Uh, and plus someone's going to be in there once a week. I'm sure if you're a supply guy at Patterson comes in once a week, they could probably show you something else on, soft, on uh, EagleSoft. But everything that happens is a process. Every time someone has any output you get, whether it's a crown doesn't fit, it was designed. You, know, you didn't pack the cord, you didn't get a good impression, you don't need, um, you're, you don't have a good lab. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. Um, a dental office isn't ran with black magic and voodoo. Um, it's all processes. And um, when they come out, um, here's our process of checking. Here's what we do to check in patients. Here's what we do to check out. Um, if they ask for something, we say no. We write down their name, number, exactly what happened. And everyone that leaves, we write down, you know, we want feedback. There's check in, greet patient, update address, update insurance, verify financial arrangement, notify clinic staff, let patient know, doctor running on time behind. Check out, verify insurance and address again, verify charts complete, the, all the notes are written up, collect all monies due, schedule next visit, check recall schedule, file insurance. I mean, and then the front office person initials the check in, the check out. So if a person comes back a week later for a crown seat and, you know, and these things weren't done, then we know exactly who up front is not doing it. And if you measure it, you'll manage it, it'll get done. So if you want it done, make it a system. Greet patient, update address, update insurance, 
verify financial arrangement, notify clinical staff, let patient know if we're on schedule. That is done every single time and initialed. I mean, how would you like it? You're all, think of what would happen in your office that was done every single time to check in. Check out again, verify insurance address, verify charts complete. I mean, you know how many times you're going in for a crown seat and no one did the notes for the, for the, the start? I mean, it's all systems. Um, same thing when they get visited. Were you satisfied with the treatment you received from the professional staff today's dental dental? Very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. I want to show you something. People don't feel comfortable saying bad things to other people because we're a social animal. That's why we have 43 different muscle contraction groups in our face, and we don't have, you know, we don't have 10 in our legs. And our legs basically do a few things. So why do we have 43 groups of muscle contractions? Uh, when someone smiles and their, their nostrils flare, their nostrils flare means anger. See, real anger is like, ah. So if nostrils flare, or if you smile, you exaggerate teeth, that's really anger. The best poker players in the world read these little subtle nostril flare, you know, your card in your nostrils flare, you're mad, you're angry, because you got a bad hand. Well, humans don't like to be mean to other humans. So they simply tell them, um, well, I'm not very satisfied, I'm satisfied. That's only 20% down. But if they downgrade you 20%, it's a 95% fatality, they'll never come back. So you gotta stretch these out over five choices because they're not gonna say, I'm very dissatisfied, I think that dentist is a jerk, I'm never coming back here again. That's just hard for a social ape to say to another ape because Apes know that, see, polar bears don't smile. They don't snuggle, they don't kiss. Because you're a polar bear, turn me loose, I can eat and kill anything that moves in my environment. I don't need anyone. But see, when you're a little ape, you don't see go with your eyes like an eagle, you don't run fast like a cheetah, you can't fly like a bird, um, you can't smell like a dog, you basically, you're a loser. And the only way you're gonna live is with your brain and a bunch of other apes together. You're a social animal like bees and ants, okay? Um, so they downgrade you 20%, it's a 95% fatality, and the only way you're gonna reverse that is now on the spot. Ma'am, why did you put satisfied? How come you weren't very satisfied? I say, well, I mean, I mean, come on, look at this crown he says. Look at that, looks like a checklet. What is he, nuts? Um, or, you know, I, that, I, know, I don't know if that assistant is uh, pregnant or what the deal is, but, uh, you know, she was just rude. So, uh, you know, systems, did we begin your appointment on time? You know, he ran a half hour late. Um, were you given your uh, post-operative instructions and your five-year warranty? Would you re recommend today's dental to a friend, coworker, relative? Why did you choose today's dental? See, these are things that we have to know the answer to. They're not options. They're mandatory in our operations and logistics. And just like getting a yes, we want to know what you're asking for that we're not giving you. So focus on these things um, for operational logistics. Thank you very much.